Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining the NOAA EBM EBFM seminar series. My name is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries. We're uh, conducting our presentation uh, through the Silver Spring NOAA Library series, and our speaker today, Kevin Friedland, is uh, in his laboratory at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Um, just a quick uh, reminder, I want to thank everyone who has joined our series and continues to join, and again, also thanking everyone for their comments. We have been reviewing your comments. Uh, just a reminder, there's an opportunity online to respond uh, following the seminar and give us uh, suggestions and input for future topic areas. So again, thanks to all the folks who dedicated uh, and, and joining us uh, month, every month. This is the ninth in our series. Um, that started last fall, and uh, Kevin Friedland is our speaker today, um, and he will be discussing uh, his uh, uh, informing us on the ecosystem assessment and management decisions by applying habitat species models. Um, Kevin's been at the Northeast Fishery Science Center and is a, a member of the uh, ecosystem dynamics assessment branch there. Uh, and just uh, before I go, uh, there is a reminder that our uh, next month we're taking a bit of a vacation. Uh, so we will not have a, a seminar in the month of August, but we will resume on September 12th with Kristen Marshall. And uh, there will be plenty of notices around with respect to the topic that she'll be uh, in continuing our series. And then the series will continue through the fall. So again, thank you to everyone. and. Um, Please, if you have any questions, there's an opportunity to do so um, at the end of Kevin's presentation. Um, and you can do that online. And obviously, we have folks here in the room in the NOAA library here at Silver Spring that can also uh, ask questions of our speaker today. So Kevin, we're going to turn uh, control over to you if you don't have it already. And again, thank you for uh, volunteering today. Thank you, Peg. It's, it's Kevin Friedland in Narragansett. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you, we can hear you very well. Thank you here in the room. Super, thank you. And so we'll, uh, we'll monitor through the, through the talk if there are any uh, questions that come up about uh, the sound. So we'll let you know if we hear and see anything. Super, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to provide uh, an overview of some habitat modeling work we're doing here in the Northeast and uh, look at some examples of how we're applying the, um, these data. Um, so there, there are a number of excellent studies in, on northeast species that have uh, utilized habitat models, but mostly concentrating on thermal responsive species and mostly modeling using GAMS or generalized additive models. So the, the first goal that I list and what we wanted to do is try to sort of expand this a bit by, by developing models that are drawing on a wider spectrum, a uh, wider range of physical and biological data, and in particular, uh, variables reflective of the uh, influence or effect of lower trophic levels. Um, and then seek ways to use these data both qualitatively to help inform scientific work and, and management decision process, but then also, in a quantitative context, um, in the assessment process um, as well. So what I'll cover today is, is sort of give a, a, a snapshot or a quick overview of the habitat model methodology that we're using. Um, then talk about four individual species and, and how we've, uh, took, we've looked at the habitat information in context to management issues with them few scallops in respect to um, discussions of uh, change in, and modification of survey design, black sea bass in respect to shifting fishery, but also um, in respect to potential impacts of um, existing and proposed energy development on the coast, American lobster um, in respect to both regional scale, but then also finer scale changes in habitat and how that might be affecting the population. Um, summer flounder, we've been developing a um, ecosystem informed index of abundance by doing some dynamic stratification. So I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of an overview of that. Then finally, from a more sort of a higher altitude look, um, look at 
uh, synoptically, uh, the results of habitat change amongst the whole range of species and what that suggests about uh, change in organization of the ecosystem here in the Northeast. So I'll first start off by a simple flow diagram to give you a sense of to how we're fitting these models. Um, we're first assembling response and predictor variables, and the response variables being drawn from our, our catch data from our bottom trawl survey, and predictor variables being a range of both physical and biological responses in the or variables in the environment. And I'll show you those in a bit more detail in, in a few slides. The training set time series for this version of the data is 1992 to 2016. And the early constraint doesn't reflect the full length of all the data sets. It's constrained by the availability of salinity data um, in the Northeast. Um, so having said that, we are already thinking about different versions of this analysis with longer and shorter time series to make use of different aspects of the data. Um, we begin by looking at uh, or testing for um, multicollinearity within the, uh, the predictor variable sets, um, variable set, and then removing um, co-varying variables or redundant variables um, um, first. Then for random forest models um, that we're fitting, we uh, utilize some R, R routines that are out there that use a model selection um, approach that's first described in Murphy et al. 2010 that scales variable importance measures then runs models with uh, variable subsets that are, that are decided by varying thresholds of importance which is designed to find the variable set that minimizes the error structure or the mean square error or, or maximizes the variance explained in the model. So in this case, we will have models that would have as few as 15 or so variables or um, more towards 40 or 50 variables, depending on the, uh, the results of that test. Then we're fitting both occupancy models based on presence absence data or and also productivity models which are based on regression type models based on biomass catch per unit effort using both random forest approach and then boosted regression trees. Uh, both of them are, are classification and regression tree models. Um, we generally found that they perform nearly equivalently the boosted regression trees very slightly better occupancy model scores. The, the, the random forest models, um, slightly better biomass models. But what I'm going to show you today is going to be limited to, um, for the single species work, limited to random forest, in part because there's um, a lot of accessory software out there to help you sort of analyze and dissect what's going on with the random forest model. Um, the final element uh, comparison of um, what's occurring in the ecosystem, I'll show you both random forest and boosted degree res tree uh, results. But I'm also limiting it um, to occupancy model results only. Um, there's a lot of interesting things occurring in the biomass models, but I won't show that today. For all these models, we looked at cross-validated uh, statistics, and then uh, for models that were were suitably fit, we estimated annual habitat um, on a tenth of a degree grid that circumscribes the, the ecosystem and survey area. So from this approach, we have 78 spring taxa that have uh, model, uh, model sets and 89 fall taxa. So just to give you, for, for those of uh, may not be as familiar with the Northeast Shelf ecosystem, uh, just to give you a little bit of orientation to the system, it's uh, the continental shelf is about um, 100 to 200 kilometers to the shelf break. Um, in this figure, the 100 meter depth contour is marked. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Bight Shelf then gradates into um, the the um, elevated um, George's Bank area, which forms the southern um, 
um, margin of the deeper Gulf of Maine. So most of the shelf is anywhere from 50 to 100 um, meters deep. Uh, the Gulf of Maine has a number of basins that uh, can be as deep as two to 300 meters in depth. So as I mentioned, the response variable is based on our bottom trawl survey, um, occurrence as a categorical variable, and then catch per unit effort, in this case, the biomass catch per unit effort um, from the survey that began in the fall timeframe in 1963 and then began um, in a spring timeframe survey um, in 1968. Um, the uh, figure on the left shows the strata that are used to um, allocate uh, trawl toes. It's a random stratified design. So then for each year, for each season, approximately 300 toes are conducted uh, within the survey area, distributed through the survey area. And on um, the right-hand side is a picture of the RV Albatross, the, one of the vessels that uh, really contributed to a great deal of the, the, the survey data um, in this time series. The predictor variables, there are 91, there's a suite of 91 predictor variables that we looked at initially uh, we started with five what I call station variables, 19 habitat descriptors, 19 zooplankton variables, and 48 remote sensing variables. So to step through these categories and give you a sense as to the distribution and trends in some of these data, uh, depth is what I'm calling a static variable in the sense that obviously it doesn't change over time. Um, however, salinity and temperature, which amongst the station variables are dynamic in the sense that we're fitting to annually varying data each year and each season. So in this depiction for, for uh, the station variable bottom salinity, on the left-hand side, panel A and then C are the mean salinity distributions in the bottom water in spring and fall respectively. And as you can see, the higher salinities are located in the deeper water off the shelf break um, seaward side and then lower salinities associated with the runoff that would occur along the coast. And then the right-hand panels are trend maps um, for the matching um, spring and fall data. So B is for the trend in salinity and the spring bottom, um, bottom water, and then D is the trend for fall salinity. And you notice they're dominated by red tones indicating that these are dominated by positive trends, or there's been a, an overall increase in salinity um, in the ecosystem. Um, this is the surface salinity data, not as structured in terms of the mean fields in panels A and C, uh, but still the higher salinities offshore. And then reinforcing this theme that for the most part, um, the trend values are indicative of uh, an increase in salinity over time. These are the bottom water um, data. Um, the, the spring and fall bottom water are sort of inverse reflections of each other. You notice that in the spring, the coolest water is, the, is located on the Georges Bank and inshore area, um, more towards shallow depths versus the warmer water that is located offshore off the shelf break front whereas it's flipped in the fall. Uh, the warmer water are associated with Georges Bank and shallow regions along the Mid-Atlantic Bight, and it's the, the deeper water that remains cool um, during the, the fall of the year. But continuing the theme of trends, you can see that in the trend maps for spring and fall, B and panels B and D, both, again, dominated by red tones indicative of an increase in temperature that's been occurring um, in the northeast shelf. And the um, surface temperature um, is a bit more arrayed by latitude. You see that the warmer temperatures are more uh, to the southern end of the ecosystem in panels A and B for spring and fall. Um, but yet again, there, um, uh, the trend maps in B and D are indicating uh, uh, positive trend or increases in temperature. So the habitat descriptor variables are all considered static variables. In other words, they're not changing over time. Um, so the same field is used 
through the entire time series. And it's a range of mostly depth-informed information about complexity or shape of the benthos. Um, and I've sampled a few of these, for example, rugosity, uh, which is a measure of small-scale variations of amplitude in of the of the bent of the, the the bottom in respect to an idealized surface, and then the bed forms is a a, a a depiction of of classification based on um, both uh, combination of seabed position, but then also the slope associated with the the, the seabed, and then there's a um, one, the final one that I'm highlighting is the benthic current velocity. We have four of these as potential variables, and they're seasonal, um, seasonal fields. In this case, this is the winter benthic current vorticity that is occurring on the shelf uh, as a potential uh, uh, habitat descriptor. The zooplankton variables are selected amongst the taxa that are the most abundant in the survey. Um, that's the first 18 lines of the table. Um, there's a range of, of organisms in here. About half of them, half of the taxa are copepods. And then there's a number of uh, other um, starfish genera, branchiopods, tunicates, barnacles. Um, and then the last line, biovolume, indicates um, a settled volume indicator of biomass that is also used. But as I mentioned, these are presented as dynamic variables, and um, I'll show you what they look like in a moment. So these data are collected, um, have been collected through um, using paired bongo trawls with 335 micron mesh, um, and as I mentioned, both yielding both settled volume and species counts. And it's a patchwork of two, including two major ecosystem monitoring programs, the MARMAP program, which began in 77, and on the left-hand side, this map shows the typical distribution of um, a MARMAP set of stations. Um, there was a transitional period uh, where we, we did lose some sample coverage, and then um, a, a replacement program, this Ecomon uh, monitoring series, went in the 90s, and this is a typical distribution of, of survey toes for Ecomon, um, but again, yielding any 200 to 300 bongo toes or depictions of zooplankton per season per year. Um, this is the, uh, this is uh, some, uh, I'll sample a couple of the zooplankton taxes just to give you a sense of the, not only the structure distribution, but then also trends as well. This is Calinus finmarchicus, which is a very large bodied copepod that occurs in the Northeast. Um, it really contributes um, a tremendous amount to the zooplankton biomass um, and is utilized by a range of species as, as forage. Um, in the upper right, where I show spring mean, is the mean of the time series of the zooplankton data. And as you can see that there's a gradation and a tendency for Calinus and Marchius to occur on the George's Bank Gulf of Maine end of the um, uh, the uh, ecosystem in the spring. And then in the upper right, the fall mean, you see that the red tones are now more concentrated in the Gulf of Maine. This is a diaposing um, zooplankton species, so they start to seek out deeper water <clears throat> later in the season and go into diapose. Um, then accompanying these mean tr um, mean trends are the the trends in spring and then fall abundances, and you can see that there's sort of mixed patterns for Calinus and Marchicus, increasing abundances uh, in the spring and declining abundances in the fall. Another important, very abundant and important species is Pseudocalinus. We have a couple of species which are very difficult to differentiate, so we we have a combined count for them. Um, I highlight their importance because they, they are an important prey taxa for a number of larval fish uh, that occur on this coast. And so their spring distributions are mostly focused in the northern part of the Mid-Atlantic Bight, and then there is a shift, seasonal shift of them more into the Gulf of Maine. But you'll notice that the spring and fall trends, the lower panels, 
you see nothing but blue. This is a species that has virtually disappeared from the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And um, in the fall as well, and they uh, have uh, declined in abundance throughout its range in the fall as well. So raising concerns about uh, its role in the ecosystem. Another very um, abundant and important taxa is Centropogies typicus. Um, this is a mostly a mid-Atlantic species in the spring, uh, very high abundance uh, um, in the mid-Atlantic bite, and then shifting onto Georgia's bank and part of the Gulf of Maine in the fall. Um, and then showing counter um, opposite trends in the two seasons, um, increasing abundance in the spring time frame and declining abundance in the fall time frame. So the remote sensing data is added in as static variables. As I mentioned early on, we're thinking about different formulations where we would include data sets as both as dynamic variables. This is one that if we use this as a dynamic variable, we would lose a lot of years to the time series in order to um, meet the requirements of the model. So right now they're going in as static variables. And so we are offering chlorophyll data, uh, both as raw data, which is denoted in the in the, the variable name as an R, and then also gradient magnitudes of chlorophyll or the frontal data associated or associated with the chlorophyll maps, which is designated with the F. And then you can see the sequence of numbers from 1 to 12 indicating the data for uh, January through December. And then likewise, the SST data is organized in the same way. Um, and then I brought up two examples, the April chlorophyll uh, mean depiction in the upper right-hand figure, um, and the bright orange areas on Nantucket Shoals and Georgia's Bank indicative of where the major spring bloom occurs on the shelf. And then um, below it, the April chlorophyll fronts, you can see that how highly developed they are um, in, in both areas. And then the upper right is August sea surface temperature. You notice that Georgia's bank is showing up as blue. Uh, the, the tidal mixing that occurs on Georgia's bank keeps the water column uh, vertically homogeneous, so it keeps Georgia's Bank proper relatively cool through the summer, and that sets up um, pretty dramatic frontal um, structures that are shown in the lower right, which are um, potentially an important feature. Um, as I mentioned, that with models that are that have um, that we've been able to fit, we then estimate the habitat values uh, for both spring and fall over the time series onto this tenth of a degree grid, which is shown in this figure, um, the blue dots indicating the grid locations um, for the northeast shelf. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll show you the results for a number of, of habitat models for species. And so I'll show you um, fit statistics um, for the occupancy models, and it'll look like the the table in the upper part of the of this slide. Um, so you'll get an accuracy score for the model fit for spring and fall. Um, accuracy being the proportion correctly classified, an AUC score for um, the model fit. A AUC stands for area under the curve, which is the area defined by um, what's called an ROC curve, or a receiver operator characteristic, a binary classifier curve, uh, which is formed by plotting um, the true positive rate versus the true um, the false positive rate over a range of probability thresholds to form this curve. And if you can envision that uh, when you form this curve, if the um, true positive and the true negative rate equal each other, it's going to define a straight line, which ends up um, defining an AUC, which you know, bisects the area, or 0.5, which is indicative of a model with little or no, with no predictive skill. In other words, it's no better than uh, tossing a coin. Um, so AUC scores that are getting into the high 0.6s are marginally acceptable um, 
AUCs of like 0.7s and into 0.8s are, are okay to good models, and AUC scores above 0.9 are, are, are somewhat suspect, actually. They, they may be too good to be true. Um, and then also you'll see this Cohen's kappa, which is a statistic which measures um, inter-rater agreement for categorical items. And it's this ratio in the formula, uh, proportion agreement, uh, based on proportion agreement and probability of, ran of random agreement. This Cohen's kappa scales from zero to one. So Cohen's kappa 0.3 and 0.4 are getting into the range of being okay models. 0.5 and 0.6 are being very good models. But having said all that, uh, I'll just focus on the AUC scores when we look at some of the model results further on. In addition to the diagnostics, I'll show you a variable importance plot, um, which is uh, based on the, um, on the model fit for the occupancy models. And so it's a two-panel plot with the left-hand um, graph showing the relationship between times of route and minimum mean minimum depth associated with the 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 uh, tree building that is occurring for the, the variables and so what are highlighted in these plots are the top 10 or top most top 10 most important variables and so times of route um, indicates how many times this variable was the um, occurred as the root node or the the first variable used to split the data, which obviously will have a tremendous influence on, on, the, um, on the model. So high numbers of times of root is indicative of an important variable. And then mean minimum depth, uh, we keep a trace during the model fitting and keep track of where in the tree uh, variables occur and compute this mean minimum depth. So Variables with low mean minimum depths means that maybe not being the root, but they were variables that were responsible for major splits in the tree farm, in the tree structure. So as you can sense, the variables that are occurring in the upper left are the more important variables. Um, and then in the right-hand panel is a plot of Gini decrease versus accuracy decrease. Gini is a probability index that uh, looks at whether a split um, is relatively pure or not. And what we mean by pure is whether a split is effective as uh, separating groups with a uh, high group infinity. And so, um, and then accuracy decrease is just a, a measure of the effect of a variable in relation to um, change in prediction accuracy. So in this case, we're looking for variables that end up in the upper right hand corner of this plot. And usually they're the same cast of characters, but they're showing nuanced differences between the performance of the variables. So I glossed over these before, but I'll show this in more detail because it will, um, I'll, this is what the, the mean and trend plots will look like for the habitat models that I'll show you in a moment. So in the left-hand panel are the mean occupancy probabilities over time for the spring and the fall in panels A and C, uh, respectively. Um, and they're scaling between zero and one. And obviously, um, high occupancy probabilities towards 0.9 are indicating a very high likelihood of the animal occurring um, in those pixel locations. Then on the right-hand side are trend maps. And the trend maps are based on Mann-Kendall trend tests and what I've plotted are the field spent slopes of the, the trend test. So uh, red indicates a uh, positive trend, blue is a negative trend in the occurrence probability over time. And these are scaled to decadal trends um, so you can compare between, um, between graphs. And then I've also, you notice there's this, these X marks all over the place or, or located on them. These are, these are grid locations where the Mann-Kendall test is significant at P less than 0 0.01. <clears throat> so the, the um, first piece I was gonna talk about is sea scallops, which is a, a tremendously important fishery here in the Northeast. Um, though it's uh, not a fishery 
um, that you associate with, with very high landings, only about 20,000 metric tons are harvested each year. Um, they're such high value that they result in um, revenues on the order of $500 million, so making them really quite important. Um, but the fishery has, has attracted, over time, has great, attracted a great deal of press and attention due to the productivity of the fishery and how, how productive it's become in recent years. And this is in large measure due to um, scientific management that has put, in, put into place. Scallops are managed uh, with sort of a rotational harvest system that is uh, critically dependent on survey information to monitor, monitor the spatial abundance and also growth of uh, scallops to order, in order to set the management. <clears throat> so the, there was a, a recent working group for scallops, and uh, one of the themes of that working group was to talk about uh, the survey design for the uh, for the scallop fishery, and talk about coordination of multiple surveys that are using different survey methodologies. So we presented uh, the um, presented the sea scallop occupancy model. Um, um, to the group uh, as it may help to um, in their in their work. We see for uh, for sea scallops we had relatively good fits for both the spring and the fall models. Um, the AUCs are nearly 0.8 in the spring and over 0.8 in the fall. And uh, an interesting theme that you'll see a number of times as I show you these plots is that to be honest with you when going into this. I wouldn't have been shocked if most of these models were um, the, the most important variables were depth and temperature or something like that. But what's emerged is a, an interesting story that we've just barely analyzed. But as you can see for scallops, um, in the spring, if you look at the upper, upper left-hand panel, um, yes, depth is an important variable. It shows up in that quad, that upper quad, upper left-hand quadrant, but then the other variables of importance are chlorophyll variables, um, indicating that the pattern of productivity may be um, quite important to defining the habitat for this species. And likewise, in the fall, um, again, depth is a very important variable, but then chlorophyll is showing up. And we see that sort of buried in the, in the pack there, Bt is bottom temperature. Um, so it is important, but uh, um, not to not to underestimate the importance of the of the productivity variables. And here are the habitat maps for sea scallop. In the spring, uh, the uh, highest occupancy probabilities are associated with the Mid Atlantic Bight and also out on George's Bank. Um, the these are not highly mobile, so um, thankfully the uh, the spring and the fall habitat distributions are pretty similar. Uh, though not exactly the same. Um, an interesting feature that we saw in the trend in habitat is that not only were the habitat's um, probabilities increasing in some areas, uh, we did notice a, a band or, or patch in the Gulf of Maine where the uh, predicted habitat occupancy um, is declining. As I mentioned, the way we utilized this data was to line the uh, habitat information up to the various um, survey years. Um, HabCam, which is a towed device, uh, drop camera, and then also Dredge, which are our point sampling um, devices. And then uh, think about where we're seeing predicted habitat in respect to the distribution of, of um, survey effort. And so the, uh, it was, it was uh, utilized in that way and, and used to consider the allocation of survey effort for scallops. So moving on to black sea bass. Black sea bass is not a large reef source. Um, only about uh, 4,000 metric tons are, are taken annually. Um, that doesn't include um, the about worth about nine million dollars, but that doesn't include its recreational impact. But the thing about um, species like black sea bass is there's a number of constraints occurring on on fishing due to um, sort of a mixed bag of resources that are in good shape and resources that are 
in poor condition, thus acting as sort of choke species. So um, the availability of, of, of resources that we could switch off to um, sort of focuses attention on things like sea bass. And um, the, as, as noted in this article in the Sun Chronicle, um, they're quite aware that, that sea bass is, is moving in, in, in regions, becoming locally available and, and rubbing up against the concerns about catch limits by state. <clears throat> well, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the, the the issues with with black sea bass are are you know shifting regional abundance that are changing requests for fisheries allocations. But also we took a look at this species in regard to um, what the potential impacts of existing and proposed energy development areas might be on a species, or could be applied to a range of species as well. So the, the black sea bass model fits are reasonably good, uh, both around 0.74 or so for both spring and fall. Um, and again, um, some interesting array of, of uh, variables showing up to be most important um, between the two seasons. In the spring, they're dominated by um, chlorophyll values, but you notice that uh, a number of them are fall chlorophyll values. So suggesting or, or, or suggesting the an interest in exploring the effects of previous productivity on where um, black sea bass might be hanging out, and then in the fall, um, temperature and depth are uh, are important variables. But also, acacia is a is more of a inshore, almost estuarine zooplankton tax. So it's interesting that that turned out to be an important uh, variable for for black sea bass. Black sea bass in the spring are uh, concentrated offshore towards the shelf break front, the C in panel A. Um, the high um, occurrence probabilities are, are, are virtually right on the 100 meter depth contour. But then in the spring, the resource moves inshore and um, are highly concentrated um, from North Carolina up to Massachusetts in the inshore area. Um, as well. And the interesting part is when we look at the trends in occupancy over time, we see that there's sort of a, a latitudinal translation occurring in the spring in panel B. We see some uh, low or almost negative occupancy probabilities in the southern mid-Atlantic bite where the habitat is occurring and then a hot spot up around latitude 40 indicating a shift in the resource further to the north. And then in the spring, I mean in fall in panel D, uh, we see a huge increase in occupancy probability um, associated with the uh, region off of uh, Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts. Um, and this is a, a fisheries con concern because they're seeing lots of resource, but really don't have the quota to utilize it um, effectively. As I mentioned there, there, this, you know, black sea bass along with other species are of concern or are of growing interest in respect to uh, both existing and, and proposed um, offshore energy development. So in this map I'm showing in blue existing lease areas um, and in red proposed uh, lease areas on the coast. And what we've done for black sea bass is to go in and extract the mean occupancy probability over time uh, for both spring and for fall and the existing and in, in proposed um, um, lease areas. So as you can see in the spring, um, the left-hand panels, the probabilities are very low. They, the resource is mostly offshore, so these more inshore oriented um, lease areas are are expected to be um, uh, low um, occurrence areas for black sea bass and not really very much change in that. But it is interesting in the right hand panels for both for the fall and both the existing in the upper right and then proposed in the lower right, uh, we see that the uh, occupancy probabilities for those areas have been increasing dramatically over time um, to uh, their highest levels in the time series in 2016. 
the we, you know habitat for black sea bass is shifting along the coast, but it's also interesting that the utilization of habitat uh, associated with energy development is also increasing um, for this species. Another important and iconic species in um, in the Northeast is American lobster. Um, American lobster is uh, managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, uh, through interstate um, agreements. And uh, again, this is another relatively low low landings but high value fishery. Um, annually, about 70,000 metric tons of lobster are taken or landed, but they result in, in, in revenues of about $650 million. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Um, could be a little different. It was, a, it was an excellent article that appeared in the New York Times about lobster, because what we're seeing with lobster are dramatic changes in regional habitat, but then also regional abundances for lobster. Declines in the Mid-Atlantic Bight and dramatic increases in the lobster in the Gulf of Maine, but then also on smaller scale, we're seeing shifts in distribution and, and expectations of, of change in habitat within the Gulf of Maine itself. And so we looked at um, coastwide shifts in habitat that may be related to the decline in some regional fisheries and expansions of others. And then also shifting distributions within the Gulf of Maine, which may have been associated, which may be associated with availability, particularly of nursery habitat, and the availability of, of larger lobsters. So the spring and fall um, occupancy models for uh, lobster are relatively good, both in the point, uh, point seven nine, almost point eight, and then uh, approximately point seven eight for the fall model. <clears throat> And again, this, this interesting theme of, of um, perhaps unexpected variable associations. In the spring, as you can see, the, the clearly the three most important variables are all zooplankton, Ketognaths, Paracalinus, and Centropic Gis typicus, um, that um, um, are, are the most important variables for the spring model. <clears throat> and then in the fall model, bottom temperature is the most important variable, but then it's accompanied by Matridia lucans, larvations, and, and uh, Centripicus hamatus, again, a, a suite of, of zooplankton variables. Obviously, um, adult lobster don't eat zooplankton. Perhaps their larval forms are utilizing these, or, or the possibility that these, the patterns of distribution that are shaping secondary productivity are also affecting the product, the distribution of, of lobster as well. So the, uh, the, the spring distribution of occupancy habitat shown in panel A emphasizes how important the main coast is uh, to the lobster fishery. That's the area of, of highest uh, um, occupancy probability in both spring and fall in panels A and C. Um, but then when you look at the trend maps, um, you see the, um, the, um, the major issues in a nutshell, um, especially in the fall, panel D, um, dramatic declines associated uh, with the occupancy probability um, in the fall, um, fall time frame in the mid-Atlantic bite, and then both in spring and fall, the Gulf of Maine showing dramatic increases in occupancy probability in the Gulf of Maine proper. But notice that the margin, the upper, the northern margin of the Gulf of Maine um, transitions to blue tones or an indication of a decline in occupancy probability more inshore. We thought this was kind of curious, so we visualized the lobster data in a different way. We took the lobster occupancy data and computed gradient magnitudes or look for fronts in the, the occupancy probabilities, which are shown in panels A and C. Um, and you see that there's a very strongly developed front in the Gulf of Maine, that orange uh, area that's indicative of a, an area where the habitat scores or, or habitat probabilities are changing rapidly. Then 
and and panels B and D, what we look at is the trend in the gradient magnitude or the trend in the frontal scores over time. And the two features that really caught our eye are the these two um, blue bands of change in frontal probability um, occurring in, in panels B and D, um, indicative of a shift in the in the edge of of lobster habitat over time. In other words, it's showing that the um, transition or, or edge of, uh, of poor to good habitat is now shifting further offshore. So these, these findings uh, sort of made sense of or sort of put into perspective the decline in southern New England resources while there's been a just dramatic or unprecedented increase in the Gulf of Maine stock. Um, but then also speaks to the issue of, of life stage habitats in the Gulf of Maine itself, that this edge or, 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 or transition zone in habitat is shifting, and that's consistent with hypotheses or observations related to where people think the nursery habitat for uh, lobster is, is shifting from inshore waters to more um, deeper or, or slope waters. And the the thing that was brought out in the New York Times article, um, and it, it, it's interesting that the lobster resources that is at its highest as we've ever seen it. So these climate shifts have, have netted a, a, a tremendous benefit to the lobster resource. However, what if we have to ask our, our, the, the question, what if the climate continues to shift? Um, can we expect uh, recreation of the detrimental effects that have been occurring in the Mid-Atlantic Bight to start to recreate themselves in the Gulf of Maine and replace the, um, the, the rather um, un, you know, unprecedented production in the Gulf of Maine with, with decline. So, so the final single species example is gonna show you is some work we're doing with summer flounder. Again, another relatively small resource about 10,000 metric tons are are taken and results in about uh, a uh, um, revenue of about $30 million, not counting recreational benefit. Um, but again, this is another resource like uh, black sea bass that um, we're seeing um, friction um, as the abundance and resource is shifting along the coast. And, um, concern about the allocational quotas um, by region are not matching what, what is being perceived as the abundance, um, abundance or availability. <clears throat> so the issue is being the shifting distribution that is, uh, but in this case, in addition to their shifting distribution, um, we're also seeing an overall decline in the resource as well. And we are looking at with summer flounders, an opportunity is to take a look at an approach of developing uh, an index of abundance, a swept area index that's based on uh, what we're calling dynamic stratification of the habitat or the occupancy towards the habitat over time. In other words, instead of having fixed strata, having strata that are responsive to where the fish may be changing distribution um, in the habitat. So the Model fits for summer flounder are really quite good um, in excess of 0.8 and for both seasons. And again, uh, a number of, of, of zooplankton and chlorophyll variables are amongst the more important variables for this taxa. Um, and like black sea bass, you see in, in the left-hand panels, it's a, there's an onshore and offshore movement between seasons that are mostly offshore in the spring and they move onshore in the fall. Um, but uh, of interest has been especially the trends that are occurring with the fall data. You see the red region in panel D on George's bank. Um, in addition to increasing their abundance more in, in the more northern part of the Mid-Atlantic Bight, um, this is a suggestion that uh, more habitat is opening up for them on George's bank as well. Um, and we can see that this, there's been a sort of a net increase in habitat for um, summer flounder. What I've plotted here is that 
three of the occupancy probability levels of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. Um, the time series of the numbers of square kilometers represented by the habitat area for summer flounder in spring and fall. Um, so for example, in panel A, um, 1.4 is related to levels of about 140,000 square kilometers of habitat. But as you see, in all cases, in both seasons and for all probability levels, the overall amount of predicted occupancy habitat for summer flounder is increasing. So in this, in this figure, we're showing a depiction of this um, uh, dynamically allocated swept area abundance estimate for summer flounder. And what we show, what we do is we we then, you know, retrospectively over time, take each annual um, estimate of occupancy habitat and subdivide the um, the habitat by different thresholds of occupancy probability, then assign the toes accordingly to these shifting shapes, and then raise up a swept area estimate accordingly. And I do it. We do it for both the northeast shelf as a whole but then also constrained to within the spatial area of the stock definition, which we show as unit. And there's general agreement uh, shown in the lower panel in the sense that the ratio of NES estimate to the unit estimate is bouncing around one until the end of the time series where now the NES estimate appears to be much larger than um, the unit estimate. And so this does raise concern as to whether the the unit definition is truly capturing the um, overall distribution and abundance of the species, and that these changes in habitat may be reflecting, be reflective of changes in the spatial abundance of the species. So this dynamic stratification provides this sort of ecosystem-based approach to um, an abundance index and a means to uh, what we're planning to do is use it as a candidate tuning index for other models in the assessment. And as I mentioned, the contrast in the estimates between the stock area and the ecosystem suggests there may be some movement out of the stock area over time. So the, the final element that I wanted to go over was this, this sort of more grander view of what's occurring with um, a range of uh, the habitats for a range of species. And I thought this was an interesting article from Rutgers talking about um, shifts in species habitat um, and the issues that it creates in terms of allocated fish stocks. So I was, we're curious to know how the fish and invertebrate community has responded to climate change on the Northeast Shelf. But to reinforce the theme that I showed you earlier, this, this ecosystem is warming. This is uh, satellite data. It's a mean annual temperature for the entire ecosystem to reinforce the idea that this is a rapidly and aggressively warming ecosystem. Um, in addition to that, um, this is northeast shelf uh, diversity and evenness of the community based on the bottom trail survey for spring and fall. So in the left-hand panels, we see that the uh, diversity and evenness is really not trending um, much, but that in the right-hand panels for fall, both diversity and evenness are trending upwards. So we have an ecosystem that's warming, and there's some indications that it's becoming more diverse. In addition, if you look at an integrated estimate of all biomass that's captured by the trawl survey as an indication of productivity of fish and invertebrates on the shelf, these are the time series trends for the spring and the fall surveys. Both trends are significantly trending upward. So we have a system that's warming, more diverse, and at least by this indication, more productive over time. This is a, a more slippery slope. Um, I wanted a catch estimate, not a landings estimate, but a catch estimate for the entire ecosystem. And so that is available through the Sea Around Us project database. And it's a catch estimate for the Northeast Shelf Large Marine Ecosystem. Uh, there is some indication of a decline in recent years, uh, though it only doesn't, it doesn't go through 2016. Um, a trend analysis of that would not indicate a, a negative trend or a decline in overall catch, but um, this is a bit of, bit of soft data in the analysis right now. And as I mentioned, we, we looked at, uh, we fit models for 78 taxa in the spring, 
and without reading the details of the plot of the, the table, about two thirds of these are taxa with uh, sort of uh, somewhat acceptable um, uh, fits in terms of their occupancy models. Their, their AUC scores are meeting sort of a minimum threshold of 0.65. And then in the fall, the 89 taxa that we have model fits for, um, again, about two thirds of them um, are taxa with um, re re relatively good fits. And what we looked at is the trend in occupancy area um, in spring and fall based on both the booster regression tree and random forest models. So what you're looking at here are the trends or the annual kilometers per year accumulated or lost in the predicted occupancy habitat at a threshold of 0.5 um, for the um, species with relatively good fits. And, and for the spring, there are 48 taxa, those are the left-hand panels that had good fits. And you'll notice that most of the taxa are showing positive trends, or in other words, increase in occupancy area. So some 46 of the booster regression tree and 42 of the random forest, um, both around 90% of the taxa showing increase in occupancy area. And in fall, um, of the 59 taxa that uh, we looked at the trends for <clears throat> 51 and 49 for the boost regression tree and random forests around mid 80s percent of the tax are showing increase in occupancy area. So the point being is that it's a system that's warming rapidly, showing signs of increased productivity and diversity, and is now supporting increased species occurrence areas with greater niche overlap. So it's a, a pretty radically changed sort of view it as a pretty radically changed ecosystem. So I'm really quite pleased with this approach in terms of dealing with large um, uh, amounts of data or different types of environmental data using these classification and regression trees. It's a very flexible approach. Um, and we're, we're using the data to provide a spatial context for understanding the things that we're seeing with species individually and then also uh, groups of species. Um, and a sort of an untapped resource, uh, literally it's just weeks old, is this variable selection results and associated importance ranking, uh, rankings that hopefully will add to our understanding of the mechanisms controlling populations. Um, so I think that we have a, a pretty ripe area to our habitat data to continue to inform what we're doing in science and hopefully contributing to the management process as well. So I thank you, and I'm quite happy to take questions if we still have time. I guess I went a little late. Thank, thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate that. It was excellent uh, and very in-depth. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. We're about a minute away from uh, closing the, the seminar. Um, what I would recommend, um, we, we do have one question, a lengthy question online. And Kevin, if you don't mind, what we'll do is give those folks uh, your email address and uh, they will uh, uh, direct the question to you because it's uh, a bit involved. Okay. Um, if there are any sort of short questions, uh, brief questions here, clarification questions, I'm looking around the room here. Okay, there's one uh, that we could probably address. What would be the case between the climate variables in your model? Can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. What would be the case if you include climate variables? Did you get that, Kevin? No, I could. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. Okay, I'm sorry. That the um, the question was, what would be the case if you included climate variables in your model? So the uh, the station data, the temperature and salinity, are climate variables. Um, you know, the the uh, the idea of bringing in other types of environmental um, indicators or basin scale indicators, they they can they can be brought in. Um, you know, I think that you know, you sort of got a, a hint that um, sort of an outgrowth of my my ongoing interest in remote sensing data and chlorophyll, and then also zooplankton data. So I sort of you know sort of went in that direction. Um, but uh, you know, the other types of information, wind over time or or NAO or things like that, obviously could be brought in as well. Okay, thanks. And we have one more uh, from Toby. 
Do spring and fall biomasses balance? Do spring and fall biomasses balance? I do not know. Uh, we don't look at that um, in the sense that we're computing a probability of of, uh, of occupancy probability. Um, I just realized that it's sort of indirectly addressed by this figure. So yeah, they're pretty close. Um, so these are this is the um, catch per toe of all biomass. Um, for the spring and fall survey. So I would say, yeah, they, they bounce. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, again, uh, it looks like uh, Emily is gonna email you, if you don't mind, and address her uh, questions there. Um, yeah, I'm in the locator and, and be quite happy to hear from folks if they have things they'd like to discuss. Yeah, and again, thank you so much uh, for devoting the time, Kevin, and uh, I'm sure it's gonna create a lot of questions going forward again uh, next month uh, we're we're taking a, a bit of a break and resuming on September 12th with Kristen Marshalls and uh, if you are interested or if you know people who would be interested in seeing these presentations they are being archived on the NOAA library brown bag series site and um, there hopefully will be the PowerPoint and then an audio and transcription for those folks who may need that Again, thank you so much for all your time and effort, and uh, we'll sign off from here from Civil Spring. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, Kevin.